writer, educationist, scholar, Rotarian. And she's also like Tagore, a classical vocalist with many national and international awards, accolades, and publications to her credit. She is a senior Fulbright scholar and a Commonwealth scholar and a national scholar and gold medalist in English from the Calcutta University in India. A university professor of English and culture studies, she's a recipient of the coveted UGC postdoctoral research award from the government of India, which she was awarded for her pop-breaking postdoctoral research work and lectures on the comparative studies and transformative visions of world women poets. She has been felicitated by the Sahitya Academy with the Avishkar Award for her dual expertise as a scholar, musician, and a poet artist. Professor Banerjee has been the Pro Vice Chancellor and the uh, ex Vice Chancellor of Kolhan University. And that is in Jharkhand. And she has published five books of poetry and she has 120 academic publications to her credit along with two academic works. Her work is widely published and anthologized nationally and internationally. Professor Banerjee also has the rare honor of being the Indian president's nominee on boards of central universities. Her pivotal areas of research and her interest in research uh, include women's global writings, Tagore's poetry, and uh, she has also trans created a lot of Tagore's poetry. She's also an exponent of ecofeminism. Dr. Banerjee is a senior Rotarian and a multiple Paul Harris fellow. Through her poetic, academic, and other writings, as well as her vocal music and sociocultural activi activism, she practices the avid promotion of peace, freedom, equality, and universal brotherhood for a better world. And all that through transcultural understanding, which shines through every facet of her work. Welcome you, Professor Banerjee. It will be a wonderful evening, and we are all eagerly waiting to hear you. Thank you very much. Over to you, Professor Banerjee. Uh, thank you, Professor Shruti Das. Uh, I'm not quite sure whether in one of your sentences you even compared me to Tagore, which was a little, uh, for me, it seemed to be really audacious, as much as the audacity with which I have picked up this uh, topic for today, which is uh, Tagore's Gitanjali and its multi-dimensionality. Uh, well, we all know that even one dimension of Tagore to be discussed uh, would be enough for perhaps a lifetime. But here I have uh, the multi-dimensions. And uh, thank you very much for having that kind of faith uh, in me and to sort of um, what should I say, inspire me to actually lecture on this uh, very, very complex topic. Uh, and it is discussing Tagore in any way is like either uh, diving deep into the ocean floor or maybe flying into the uh, limitless expanses of the sky. And I think I'm quite a limited human being to do any of these two. But anyway, without much ado, uh, I will get into uh, all the jottings that I've done because I know I cannot get into a rambling lecture, which I'm used to. So I start with my thing, um, with my talk on Tagore's Gitanjali and its multidimensionality. In our contemporary world, where nothing but turmoil prevails, it becomes almost imperative today for the academic and literary fraternity, including our youth, to read and understand Tagore's Kitanjali not just as a mystic come poetic document of great literature with a lot of literary analysis, but also 
one which uplifts and elevates our mind and soul to tread the positive avenues of truth and peace and goodwill which are so necessary today in this turbulent world and that's where we place Tagore today but we will go into the literary aspects also however I wish to admit that the appropriation of Tagore within a framework of critical interpretations of theories is not just a daunting task it is almost to me an impossible one yet the starting point of these mystic poems could very well be perceived as within the elementary and elemental foundational uh, framework or paradigm of our ancient Indian mystic Upanishads and also is a large extent placed within the diverse cultures of the oriental traditions of Sufism uh, which underscore the simultaneity, the simultaneity of the humanization of the divine and also the divinization of the human and this is the pivotal point of my uh, study today okay these are melodies which integrate the soul and the sense for creating an indivisible union of the evanescent phenomenal world of, the, of our physical senses on the one side with the metaphysical arena which lives deep within us within every human being that we can know of of course it's another matter that we don't explore into those divine depths which every human being has and so uh, I just have to wear my specs I can't see okay now such essentially spiritual cosmology is comparable and evident in the poetry of our Indian poets like Kabir which, who uh, Tagore translated two years after his receiving the Nobel Prize in 1915 the songs of Kabir translated by Tagore and we find also a lot of threads which intertwine with our Bengali Sufi Lalon Fakir and also of course with the Oriental Sufis like Amir Khosru, Jalaluddin Rumi, Khalil Gibran, etc., etc. So this is where I place him. Uh, of course, Tagore is a slightly more, I would say, intricate in this uh, exploration of the connectivity which he tries to find between the human and the eternal Tagore states and I quote the infinite dwelling of the infinite being is everywhere in earth water sky and air he who is within is also without I see him and none else am I audible am I audible yes, Yes, ma'am. We're loud and clear. Hence, the all pervasive manifestations of the omnipresent and the omniscient divine in our everyday realities is actually the summation and the essence of Tagore's multi dimensional Gitanjali. And here lies the crux of this multi dimensionality because I do not think even in the traditions of Sufism uh, there is a kind of a dissociation between the divine beloved and the human beloved which we do not find in Tagore Tagore is absolutely in a kind of an unified sensibility which uh, makes him uh, so absolutely different from the others 
during Tagore's third visit, and now this is something which our students will enjoy, it's a small little story. In his third visit to London, he had promised his friend, the famous painter and artist, Rodenstein, that he would come and read trans English translations, his own English translations of his Bangla poems of Gitanjali, which he uh, renamed Song Offerings in Rodenstein's house in 1912. And during the course of his journey on the ship, because we did not have air travel then, he in the ship had uh, translated 103 poems of his 157 poems of Gitanjali in Bangla, but his translations in English were 103 poems, which he actually was carrying in an attache uh, from his uh, from the seaport to London. But and here is the great. I mean, the young people will like it. Uh, this is a small story, uh, which maybe it adds a little bit of a spice. And in the London tube, Tagore lost his manuscript in the Atachi. And though his Bangla poems of Gitanjali were already published, his English poems were written on the ship. And that was the only diary which he had. And I would like to show to everyone this original facsimile of Tagore's Gitanjali, which is not a published copy. I managed to really uh, try my very best in the Library of Congress in Washington, DC, about several years ago, to get this original manuscript handwritten by Tagore. On one side, his Bengali, and the other side, his 103 English poems, that too in his own writing. But when it got lost, ultimately, after several hours, it was found by a old lady, an old lady, who placed it in the lost luggage office of the Baker railway station in London. And history was really in the making. You know, nobody knew. Tagore did not know. Tagore only promised that he would read some translations of his poems to his friends. But history was in the making. Nobody knew. And of course, the most powerful poets, Shruti, just in case you can't hear, please let me know. OK? Hello? You're very audible. Don't worry. You're very audible, ma'am. Yeah, OK. So uh, when, it, when this lady had placed it in the lost luggage office, he got it back in the Baker station. And he was very happy. And it, again, it was one of those wily, I would say, tricks of destiny that he found it. And he was the very next day in Hampstead, in Rodenstein's home, reading his 103 English translations to uh, his friends, uh, where the most uh, important British poets of the time were present including W.B. Yeats, Ezra Pound, um, uh, Thomas Sturge, um, Moore, uh, Rodenstein, etc., etc. So all of them were present. So here began the glorious journey of Tagore's Gitanjali, a slim book which paved the way for Tagore to become, till date, the only Indian to receive the Nobel Prize in Literature, and also the only Asian uh, at that point of time. Later on, of course, one or two uh, Chinese uh, writers have got it. But till date, it is the only he's the only Nobel laureate in literature. It must be noted, however, that Tagore went to give his acceptance speech of his Nobel Prize uh, on the uh, after eight years of his receiving the prize, the understanding of Gitanjali would remain totally, totally incomplete without quoting just a few lines from W.B. Yeats's wonderful, marvelous introduction 
to Tagore's song offerings, Sogitanjali, uh, which is a manifesto of the deep impact that it had on the Western mind and held them spellbound because Yeats was already getting interested in Indian mysticism and the Upanishads. So writes Yeats in the introduction, and it would be really incomplete unless I read a few of his lines of W.B. Yeats. These prose translations of Tagore's poetry have stirred my blood as nothing has for years. To read one line of his, says Yeats, is to forget all the troubles of the world. A gentleman told me of Mr. Tagore's family and how for generations these great men have come out of these cradles of greatness. Rabindranath's brother, a great philosopher, and here lies the, the uh, what should I say, the point that I'm trying to make. Oh my God. Rabindranath's brother, uh, the great philosopher Rathindranath, had the squ squirrels from the boughs climb onto his knees. He was a great philosopher, a great scholar, but he had the squirrels from the boughs of trees climb onto his knees while the birds would alight upon his hands. Says Yeats, I notice in these great men of thought a sense of visible and physical beauty and meaning as though they held that we must not believe just. They held that we must not believe just in intellectual and moral truths or certitudes, but also look at the beauty of the natural and physical world around us. This statement accentuates the undeniable completeness of Tagore's, what I would call the unified sensibility and mysticism, quite rare, quite rare. And this unified sensibility, which is rooted in our Indian ethos, if I may say, which integrates the phenomenal world with the cosmic, which combines our transient pains and joys with the stasis of sacred, which lies deep inside our subterranean selves. So Yeats goes on to say, I have carried the manuscript, this manuscript of translations with me for days reading it in railway stations, on the top of omnibuses, and in restaurants. These lyrics are full of the subtlety of rhythm, of untranslatable delicacies of color, and display, display in their thought a world I have dreamed of all my life long. The work of a supreme culture, they yet appear. Now, this is a very important line. The work of a supreme culture, they yet appear as much the growth of the common soil as the grass and the rushes. These verses will not lie in little well-printed books on sophisticated lady, ladies' tables, nor will it be carried by students at the university to be laid aside. But as the generations pass, travelers will hum them on the highways of life, and men rowing upon the rivers will sing them at every moment, the heart of this poet will flow outwards to these without any derogation or condescension. That's it. 
I think uh, this is the crux of what I'm trying to establish. The most significant and fundamental point of Tagore's Kitanjali is that it is not merely a spiritual or a mystic record of poetic salutations to a remote external God who sits apart in a religious temple, oblivious of nature, of humanity, and the infinite pleasurable manifestations of these. Nor is it a series of holy prayers to some segregated, dissociated divinity who is totally unconcerned or unaware of the world of our tumultuous human affairs, of infinite bliss and searing agony. These song offerings of Gitanjali are the product of a transcendental poetic imagination which amalgamates both the natural and the human world of multifarious colors and physical effervescence with the metaphysical domain. I repeat, it combines and amalgamates the multifarious colors and physical effervescence with the metaphysical domain of the sacred seated well within man's inner cosmic consciousness. Tagore shows us that that significant shows us that significant ladder or connectivity between the spirit and the senses, a supreme connectivity between the ether and the earth, or as Wordsworth would say, the twin points of heaven and home. This integrated sensibility is evident in most or perhaps all of Gitanjali's poems, but I will only focus on just three or four to accentuate the singularity as well as the multidimensionality of the song offerings. Now here goes poem number 27, which is, I feel, very, very uh, pivotal, very, very essential to understand Tagore's Gitanjali. It is an exhortation to light, L-I-G-H-T, but paradoxically, it is the light which is in, ignited with the burning fire of desire. Now, this is a, again a very, all these poems are very small. In, in poem number 27, this is the poem, light. Oh, where is the light? Kindle it with my burning fire of desire. There is the lamp, but never a flicker of flame. Is such thy heart, thy fate, my heart? The sky is overcast with clouds, and the rain is ceaseless. I know not what this is that stirs in me. A moment's flash of lightning drags down a deeper gloom in my spirit, and my heart gropes for the path where the music of the night, where the music of the night calls me. Light, oh, where is the light? Kindle it with the burning fire of desire. It thunders and the wind rushes. Let not the hours pass by in darkness. Kindle the lamp of love with thy life. Okay, so here was the first poem. Uh, now this, of course, I have to go into the dichotomy of this because this is something which we really do not find in why should would I why would I say many poets? We don't find really in in poets as such, even if they are mystic, even if they are transcendental, even if they are romantic, whether it's Wordsworth or Emerson or Thoreau, or even the Sufis. In Gitanjali, hence, Tagore is in total alignment 
with our Indian ethos in which, if you see, on the facades of the sacred temples, we will see this burning desire, these, these sculptures of, of amorous relationships between man and woman, even to the extent of being erotic. But beyond the temple facades, now this is something which generally a Western mind would never really understand, because beyond the temple facades, when we enter the Sanctum Sanctorum, we really see this divinity which sits well within ourselves, the celebration of a supreme faith of oneness, which, of oneness which without abnegating the sensorial experiences of the phenomenal world, also celebrates the divine stasis and elevates us to that sphere which is almost non-definable. It is a gift of solace and tranquility to our, to our conflict-ridden world, turbulent from this sage bard, Tagore, who has demonst demonstrated through this stupendous work of love, art, humanity, divinity and mysticism, he has shown us how to delve within that inner self which invokes this integration of connectivity between the eternal and the ephemeral, between the transient and the uh, non-transient, the earth and the ether, the natural and the supernatural, and most significantly, between the human and the divine. Now I go to my second part. There are three parts of this thing uh, to understand at least a little bit of Gitanjali. The second most important point of Tagore's sacred exhortation of the divine is, mind you, is entrenched in his total, total rejection of organized religion, of institutionalized dogma and ritual practices. We know that he gave up his Brahminism, his, he was one of the Banerjees, but he gave it up because he was totally against casteism, against religious disharmony, and he adopted the tenets, the thoughts and the tenor of the Upanishads as the Brahman, the Brahma, which is the Atma. Hence, with reference to this second important strand of Tagore's uh, multidimensionality in Gitanjali, I wish to quote another poem, which is poem number 28 from his original transcript. And this is a very famous poem, which most of us have heard at some point of our lives. And it's so famous, and it's so integral to Tagore's understanding of life and super life. Tagore's poem in Gitanjali says, now here it goes, leave this chanting and singing and, and telling of beads. Whom dost thou worship? In this lonely, dark corner of a temple with all its doors shut, just open thine eyes, open thine eyes and see thy God is not before thee. He is there, and here goes the statement, thy God is not before thee in the temple. He is there where the tiller is tilling the hard ground. This is also what Yates had said. He is there where the tiller is tilling the hard ground and where the path maker is breaking stones. He is with them in sun and in shower. 
and his garment is covered with dust. Put off thy holy mantle, and even like him, come down onto the dusty soil. Deliverance, Tagore continues, where is this deliverance to be found? Our master himself has taken upon him the bonds of creation. He is bound with all of us forever. Come out of thy meditation and leave thy flowers and incense aside. Leave thy flowers and incense aside. What harm is there? In your clothes, which are tattered and stained, meet him, stand by him, hug him in toil and in the sweat of thy brow. That's the second poem. Very important poem. In this poem, we can also, we must look at that metaphor, the path breaker breaking the stones. It is very symbolical. It is not just the path breaker who has tattered clothes, who is impoverished, who is poor, and he's creating a path. He's making a road. But he's also talking of that path breaker who may be in tattered clothes. But we have so much to learn from him to really find the path of God. So this path breaker, I think, is a very important coinage of Tagore in his English translation. So in this poem, we can very well hark back to W.B. Yeats's, as I said, introduction of Gitanjali, in which he overtly praises these mystical hymns as being totally within the realm of the ordinary people who earn their bread while tilling the land or catching fish or rowing their boats with infinite pleasure and pain which are never dissociated from that deep sublimity which is hidden and submerged within us. And that is the self, with a capital S, of humanity, uh, let us say, enclasping, embracing all, regardless. One needs also to recall in this context Tagore's Tego's rejection and giving up of his Hindu Brahminism, as I said, as the loudest protest against the dogmatic religious practices and that curse of Indian casteism, which goes on till date, which goes on even till today, which created and have created forever these thorny boundaries and barriers between man and man, between every creed and every ethnicity and every color and every race. So the song offerings of Tagore are also those, those chants of peace which unite man, nature and God with the same thread of bonding. And due to, of course, due to lack of time, we cannot discuss all the imaginative uh, transcendentalism that we find in some way, in some ways, not in all ways, comparable to uh, Tagore's uh, transcendentalism, whether it's the Wordsworthian sublimity or whether it is the transcendentalism of the American poets or whether it's the uh, mystic poetry of the Sufis. We cannot go into all that, but one... Let us just say that in more ways, in more ways than one, Tagore's invoca invocation of that ideal personal godhead or personal godhood residing, it's residing within the human spirit, as well as nature's every transplendent hue in all its colors and flavors, remain unique in its extraordinarily assimilative and integrative aspects that the poet 
uh, uses in his writing. And thirdly, perhaps the most significant trait of Tagore's multidimensional mysticism is his total disbelief and abnegation of asceticism, of sainthood, which in today's world we associate with the saffron color. I do not want to go into saffronization, but I would definitely like to stress the third strand, which is also very important, his total abnegation of asceticism or the, redu the renunciation of all the radiant joys and sights and sounds and sufferings of the human world in order to attain some kind of an esoteric tranquility or sublimity within. Tagore's writings are not esoteric in, in the larger sense of its connotations. They may be esoteric when you first read them, but they are not esoteric in being dissociated from, uh, you know, from whatever we associate with sainthood. So his total ab abnegation of uh, renunciation. And as in the Indian Upanishads, he always talks in that same vein as that famous Upanishad axiom, which says, Aham Brahmasmi, I am He with a capital H, which means the Godhood that we are talking about is no separate entity. It's not, not some kind of a dissociated spirit who we have to pray to day and night and give up and renounce life, we can still be in bonding with Godhood in our ways of truth, in our ways of justice, in our ways of believing in an egalitarian society, in our ways of believing in humanity, which is a part of Godhood. And this is embedded within our human self. Aham Brahmasmi, this great thought of the uh, of the Upanishads. So now the last poem which I want to uh, quote about his abnegation of asceticism, in poem number 62 from the original manuscript, Tagore translates into English, deliverance is not for me in renunciation. Deliverance is not for me in renunciation. I feel the embrace of freedom in the thousand bonds of delight. I feel the embrace of freedom in the thousand bonds of delight. Thou ever pourest for me the fresh draught of thy nectar, of various colours, fragrance, filling this earthen vessel to the brim. Thy world will light its hundred different lamps with thy flame. No, no, I will never shut. I will never shut the doors of my senses. If you may recall, John Keats had once said, Oh, for a life of sensations, not thought. Though he was a very thoughtful and deeply spiritual romantic, but he did say, oh, for a life of sensations. So here is Tagore, in some ways comparable to the romantics. I will never shut the doors of my senses. All the delights of sight and hearing and touch will bear thy delight. Thy delight. Yes, all my illusions, all my illusions will burn into the illumination of thy joy and all my desires will ripen into thy fruits of love. So here we see the unraveling of the beauties of nature, of the human world and the formless and the forms of the real world which ultimately 
in the Gitanjali culminates in that great formlessness, that ineffable, that indescribable formlessness which stays deeply in the sacred silence of ourselves. So he says, Thou art the sky, and thou art the nest as well. O oh, thou beautiful! There in the nest, it is thy love that encloses the soul with colours and sounds and odours. There comes the morning. Now look at this beautiful imagery. There comes the morning with the golden basket of her right hand, bearing the wreath of beauty, silent, silent. And then there comes the evening over the lonely meadows, deserted by herds, carrying cool the draught of peace in a golden pitcher from the western oceans of rest. Look at this beautiful imagery of sunshine, of sunrise and sunset. But there where spreads the infinite sky for the soul to take a flight reigns the stainless white radiance of thee. This is no day or night, nor form or colour, and therefore never, never a word. So this ascendancy, I will say this climbing, this ascendancy from the world of forms and evanescence to that of the intangible formlessness of the cosmic consciousness is the crux of the multidimensional facets of Tagore's Gitanjali. I would say this seminal poetry of Tagore teaches us to move beyond, to move beyond all barriers and boundaries, bristling boundaries created by religion, caste, race, ethnicity, in search of that ultimate archetypal Tagorean assimilation of truth, beauty, and godhood, a representation of our ancient Indian axiom, Satyam, Shivam, Sundaram. Often I would compare it also to Keats's, uh, Keats's Ode on a Grecian Urn, where he says, Whatever is beauty is truth. That is all he know on earth and all he need to know. But this again uh, originates from the maxim of ancient India, Satyam Shivam Sundaram. So beauty is truth, truth beauty. So Gitanjali is the total affirmation of life, of life in all its kaleidoscopic dimensions rotating and centred on the fulcrum of the seer poet's total surrender and dedication to that inner spark of the sublime consciousness which energises our sphere of being and non-being, or going beyond being, which is beyonding the being. Finally, it is an inspirational journey for all of us. It is an inspirational journey of completeness, of wholeness, which encapsulates the movement, the motion from the finite to the infinite, from transience to permanence, from the tumescence an efflorescence of nature and man to the sacred silence of the world beyond our being. Tagore provides these significant interlinks and interweavings in the entire Gitanjali 
and this is a movement i should say and i would like to define as a movement from chaos to cosmos to reach that summit of wholeness that celestial calmness with the full poem from gitanjali this is a very very famous poem uh, which we also sing in bengali amare tumi korecho ashesh ashesh korecho emni tomari lila thou hast made me endless such is thy pleasure this frail vessel of mine thou emptiest again and again and fillest it ever and ever with fresher life which means this frail vessel of mine that tego talks about the human vessel is never emptied in the sphere of godhood because all the time god is filling it with more and more this little flute of a reed thou hast carried over hills and dales and hast breathed through it melodies eternally new at the immortal at the immortal touch of thy hands my little heart loses its limits in a great joy and gives birth to utterance ineffable ages pass and still thou pourest and pourest still there is room to fill so indeed there goes limitless rhapsody which will continue forever ringing in our ears and also ringing through the corridors of eternity immortality and history thank you thank you very much professor banerjee it was what would i say an illuminating lecture a wonderful lecture and it was definitely uh, something you know like a balm on the soul with your melodious voice thank you very much i would uh, now i mean there are a lot of questions and um, there is also a request from professor sharbani banerjee um she wants you to sing a few lines of rabindra sangeet with a melodious voice and uh, <laughs> so can we okay, have the song I, I after that uh, the question or would you like to do that later just a few lines if you don't mind yes i would uh, then uh, you know if i knew i would bring my transcription because even then i can sing <laughs> but i can give you a synopsis because i have been transcribing tagore since time immemorial but i will sing the bengali song i'm sure, sure. if i give you the synopsis everybody will understand just, just let me bring uh, yeah. gitanjali let me bring the uh, gita bita one minute oh, dear, dear, dear. we'll have the questions very soon i have listed down the questions there are so many questions and uh, well uh, we'll you know any lecture on uh, ramindranath tagore is not complete without a few lines of rabindra sangeet and um, professor banerjee in her melodious voice will sing her own transcreation what better than that so there she is back
<laughs> Shruti, uh, I just hope you had told me earlier because I have not uh, brought out from my computer the English transcription. Doesn't but I can give you just a that. small synopsis. Yeah, synopsis. Uh, yes. Now this, this, this uh, yeah, I am just trying to fulfill a little bit of this request. I though I was not very much aware of this, but anyway, so I just uh, <laughs> thank you, man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm from Vishwa Bharati, so I cannot resist your voice. I'm a Shantini person. I'm a 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 person. i am a person i a song which is, you know, being a classical singer, uh, uh, because Tagore, many of, I will not say all, but I find a lot of his songs are based on three important ragas. Uh, ragas. One is Iman Kalyan, the other is yes. Behag, and the mm -hmm. third is Bhairavi. So I will yes, now yes, sing a very famous song based on Rag Yaman Kalyan. I think it is evening, so it's an appropriate time to me shondhar megho mala and uh, <laughs> and uh, this of course is you know uh, this is a song which uh, i think the lyric the song lyric itself has you know has the more i look at it the more uh, i would not say astonished I, I think that's an understatement it's you know he says to me he is comparing, I mean, most of Tagore's uh, Prem and Puja poems or Love and God poems, which I've done a lot of these programs of Love and God, they are interconnected. You may read a Love poem and you may think it is a Puja poem and you may read a Puja poem and you may think it is a Prem or a Love poem. Now, this interconnectivity, of course, again, is a part of his Indian ethos. So. This is based on Rag Yaman Kalyan, which is an evening rag. And he says, he's comparing, it is a love poem. He is comparing this lady love to the wreaths of the clouds, the clouds which are like ringlets. And he is comparing all kinds of infinite descriptions of beauty in describing a woman whose love he's so wrapped in that he says that his blood, his blood of his heart has become her alta or the red kind of lining on her, her feet. And she, he says, Tumi amar shadhero shadona. Now look at this dichotomy. Shad is desire. This is what I was talking about. Shad is desire. Can you? Uh, there's some sound. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. We can hear Hello? you. Hello? Yes, ma'am. You are absolutely okay. clear. No problem, ma'am. So the lady love says, uh, the lady love doesn't say, the poet says, to be amar shadhero shadona. Now look at this dichotomy, the duality that shad is is earthly desire and as it is combined with sadhana or shadona which is basically a kind of a sainthood uh, you know enlightenment whatever so you know all these dualities make tagore so rich and so i would say so delightfully complex not just complex but so delightfully complex and we i have talked so much that <laughs> My voice is choked. But anyway, let me see. Ah 
তুমি সন্ধার মেঘমালা তুমি আমার সাধের সাধনা তুমি সুন্দর মেঘ মালা তুমি আমার সাধের সাধনা মম শূন্য গগন বিহারি প্লাগ ইন ফাইন অ্যানাদার পাস হোস ব্যাটারি পাওয়ার ইজ লো লগা কে রাখো না তুমি সন্ধান মেঘ মালা তুমি আমার গাগনু বিহারি তুমি আপন মনের মাধুরি মিশায় আমি আপন মনের মাধুরি মিশায় তোমার করেছি রচনা তুমি আমার তুমি আমার মম অসীম গগন বিহারি তুমি সন্ধার মেঘ মালা তুমি আমার সাধের সাধনা ওয়ান মোস্ট অ্যানজান দেন ওকে মামরি দায় রক্ত রাগে তব চরণ রাঙিয়া মম হৃদয় রক্ত রাগে তব চরণ দিয়েছি রাঙিয়া ওই সন্ধ্যা স্বপন বিহারি তব অধর কেছি সুধা বিষে মিশে মম সুখ দুঃখ ভাঙিয়া তুমি আমার তুমি আমার মম বিজন জীবন বিহারি তুমি সন্ধার মেঘ মালা তুমি আমার সাধের no but thank i have never you. ever in my entire <laughs> life you. done a recording no shruti <laughs> i just want to mention no it was just my entire life i have never so done a recording is, with so much of talking <laughs> <laughs> so much of talking it's a broken voice it's okay, my I voice know. is better than this ইন্টারশন ইফ ইউ ডোন্ট মাইন্ড ম্যাম শুড বি স্টার্ট উইথ কোয়েশন ওকে I think um, uh, Professor Molly Joseph has a question. Can someone unmute her? Or oh, Molly Joseph, you can unmute yourself. Madam, you can unmute, unmute yourself. Yes. A short question. Yes. Am I audible? Yeah. Am I audible? You are. Yeah. Mm. It has been such a wonderful evening. Here I am attending it from the southern tip of India, Kerala. And... Uh, let me first uh, it's not a question round actually it's just a feedback 
from my part. Dr. Lakshmi Sri has been giving such an insightful, illuminating talk on the great legacy. Thank you, Molly. Oh, Chago. Thank you, and Molly. Yes. yes. I must I'm mention giving... here that yeah. this lineage yeah. that we are talking about, I do come from that lineage in the real sense of the term. The only okay. thing is that our branch remained Brahmin and the other branch became Brahmo. That's all. Yeah. But anyway, I was yeah. brought up with this. Thank you, Molly. Yes. Yes. Uh, I'm very glad to hear you. Yeah. And uh, one uh, question or a uh, kind of a line of thought that crossed my mind is, you know, what was uh, our Gurudev's concept on patriotism, actually? Did he believe in the very word patriot, patriotism and all that? Because these are days when there is a kind of aggression, nationalist way of it work. Hmm? Right. There are, there are some related, yes. Um, so a very good question, Molly. Yeah. A there, very, very good question. Because in this context, I will implore, request everyone from the young people to the mid to whoever is present. Please do read Tagore's essay, which is actually uh, quite a book. It's a, it's as, uh, let us say, a book as much as um, the Gitanjali, and it is called Nationalism. Now, uh, Tagore, though he was born in the cradle of a, a revolutionary family, a very erudite cultural family where uh, many of the uh, cultured erudite members uh, were actually writing a lot about our struggle for independence. He himself had written a whole segment of uh, lyrics and songs called Swadeshi, Swadeshi in Bengal, in Bengali. But towards the latter half of his life, after uh, in 1941, as we know, he took his birth in 1861. He passed away at the age of 80. But during the latter half of his life, uh, he passed away, let us say, six or seven years before Indian independence. During the latter half of his life, he went through two world wars. And he also saw that in the name of patriotism and nationalism, though he had written nationalism and Swadeshi songs early in life, he outgrew it. And he mentions this later on in a book called Crisis of Civilization. He says, nationalism cannot be more important than humanity. These are his exact lines. He outgrew nationalism because he saw that in the name of nationalism throughout the world, whether it was America or Japan or Europe or India, people were practicing jingoism, xenophobia, and a kind of total disharmony, which was actually through all the two world wars, and then the fight for our national independence. And that is where he deferred. He radically differed from Mahatma Gandhi, though, though this is something which all us youthful students need to know, that the difference of opinion between Gandhiji, Mahatma Gandhi, and Rabindranath Tagore was only in terms of their political, difference of political opinions. But the appellation of Mahatma to Gandhiji was given by Tagore himself, that he is a Mahatma. And the appellation of Gurudev to Tagore was in turn given to Rabindranath by Mahatma Gandhi. And Mahatma Gandhi kept on visiting Shanti Niketan from his first days when he returned as a barrister from South Africa, when he gave up his uh, uh, his suited booted uh, raiments and 
went into the loincloth from those days till the end. They were great friends, despite. Now, this is something which we must learn, that despite difference of opinion, there cannot be acrimony between real friends or real human beings who respect each other, where there's mutual respect. So Tagore gave up on that kind of jingoism, which I'm afraid is being practiced today also. And that is something which he gave up and willingly gave up and said, that is not patriotism. And even then, if there is something called genuine patriotism, even then I rate humanity as greater and larger than nationalism. Uh, Ma'am, uh, thank you very much for this wonderful answer. There is a related question about nationalism. Uh, some people have asked, brought up this question. They have asked uh, one Mr. Surya Rao, and there are other people who have sent this question. They have asked, uh, what is the difference between Aurobindo's mysticism, Tagore's mysticism, Aurobindo's nationalism, and Tagore's nationalism? <laughs> yes, I. It is a very good question again, but I don't want to explore beyond because it's the yeah. time is short. Yeah, exactly. uh, well, uh, Sri Aurobindo, before he became the saint Sri Aurobindo, he was a total revolutionary of Bengal, having used the methods of, if we may, may use, violence and bombed a Britisher, and he was caught, and Desh Bandhu Chittaranjan fought Sri Aurobindo's case so that he was not uh, hanged to death as many had been hanged because Bengal revolutionaries were uh, right into the midst of this national struggle. So Sri Aurobindo's nationalism was a kind of an active, in a certain way aggressive nationalism. Uh, but after this bomb bombing uh, took place and after he was uh, taken up by the Britishers, he totally renounced the path of revolution. He went deep within himself and his uh, uh, mysticism, if we may use that word, is not exactly Tagore's mysticism because he deals, for example, his famous epic poem titled Savitri, which is perhaps the greatest uh, epic poem of Sri Aurobindo. Of course, he gave up his revolutionary ideas totally. He became a total ascetic. So in terms of his asceticism, he is not Tagore, because Tagore has said many in many sentences, in many poems, that so beautiful is this world. This is a beautiful world. I do not wish to renounce it. But Sri Aurobindo renounced it totally in his asceticism. So his revolution was totally aggressive and his asceticism was also total. But Tagore's was, I will never say it was muted. His radical ideas were there. But he was uh, more of a, uh, what should I say, uh, radical in his thoughts and through his pen, not in activism, not in throwing bombs, or not in, uh, you know, his ideas were also in a certain way very non violent. So that kind of violence that was being embraced by many revolutionaries, in, including the Bengali revolutionaries, was not Tagore. He was only using his pen. And of course, there is one song which everybody is singing today, including Amitabh Bachchan. Jodi to dak shune keu na ashe tabe akla chalore. If nobody listens to your call, then go it alone. Which means that Tagore in 1905 wrote this song as a protestation through his pen. 
his protestation through his pen against the British first partition of Bengal. For two years before the actual partition of the country because the British were very afraid of the Bengal revolutionaries. So they in their own skewed and cunning mentality said we have to divide the state and hence it became a part of Pakistan which then became later on Bangladesh and West Bengal remained with us. So that was a protest song but then when he rang up Gandhiji and he also uh, approached Desh Bandhu Chittaranjan, great uh, national, uh, greatly into the national struggle for independence, they said, We do not want to uh, raise eyebrows among the Britishers today in 1919 when there was the Jallianwala Bagh massacre. So after 1905, after the partition of Bengal, this song became absolutely. You know, everybody was singing it because Tagore again raised his voice against the Jallianwala Bagh massacre with the same song which he had written against the partition of Bengal. And he proved it through his action once in his life. And he renounced his knighthood that I do not need any Gandhiji, I do not need anyone to protest against this horrible genocide and massacre uh, by the British of these innocent people in Jallianwala Bagh. So he wrote this wonderful, I have read this letter and put it in the extracurricular activities of my PG and MPhil classes to read the English that Tagore uses in this letter. And I will ask you to find that letter in which he renounces his knighthood with a language which can beat hollow the English of any Britisher with so much dignity, with so much humility, and with so much efflorescence of language. So that, I think, itself is a piece of English literature. So these two ideas came to me, and they are different. Thank they you, are different. Thank you, ma'am. There are a lot many more questions. Uh, Professor Ratna Goha wants to know that Tagore described the poems of Gitanjali as revelations of my true self. So what does the expression true reflect? Can you repeat it? I can't hear it. Uh, Tagore described the poems of Gitanjali as revelations of my true self. So what does the, the what the what of uh, the what of Gitanjali? Uh, the poems in, in Gitanjali, Tagore yeah. describes uh, his true self, right? Okay, so, okay, what okay. does the expression true reflect? Yeah, uh, at the very beginning of this lecture, I hope uh, our uh, uh, revered guest has re uh, heard my lecture. I had already said that Tagore's affirmation of outer life and his affirmation of the inner self. Now this inner self, I said, was very much in alignment with our ancient wisdom that we find in the Upanishads. Now in Upanishads, we say, Aham Brahmasmi, I am he, which is in another word, I am that same divinity we, who sits in silence within my the sacred seat of my heart. So I think in one uh, way, the true self or that glory of the inner spirit, which uh, Tagore embraced through his, uh, through his uh, exemplary following of ancient Indian Upanishadi philosophy, is what he describes as his true self. The true self has an outer encrustation, but basically that is an encrustation which he doesn't want to negate because he says life is important, the external forms of life are important, but his true self obviously is that cosmic consciousness, that inner sparkle of the spirit of godhood 
which seats itself deep within himself. And that is the Aham Brahmasmi and that deep true self that Tagore talks about. Thank you, Madam. Uh, Dr. Balabhadra Tripathi from the Department of English, Barampur University, wants to ask a question. Yeah. Dr. Tripathi. Thank you, Madam, for such a wonderful talk. Thank you. We enjoyed it this evening. Um, I have a question regarding your association uh, making the connection between Tagore's poetry and romantic poets, uh, particularly referred to the poems of uh, uh, Wordsworth and Keats uh, while talking about uh, Tagore's poetry. So naturally, the romantic poets uh, like Tagore, um, they were celebrating life, beauty, senses, and all that. My question is, can we, can we find some more connections between uh, the Tagor, uh, uh, Tagore's poems and romantic poems? For, for example, uh, can we find the revolutionary strain uh, in, between the, uh, in between the romantic poets and Tagore's poetry? Uh, can you find such a connection? Uh, well, uh, the revolutionary strain, I do not really find but in Wordsworth or Keats. A lot of it may be there in Keats's Prometheus Bound and Prometheus Unbound because he was uh, influenced very much, Keats specifically, though all the romantics have been, uh, you know, have been influenced and impacted, as we know, by the French Revolution. But I do not see much of that uh, revolutionary or French revolutionary spirit in the poetry of uh, Wordsworth or Keats. What I was trying to say what was that Wordsworth, the pioneer, the father of English Romantic poetry, was the first person who broke himself away from the neoclassicism of his earlier poets like Dryden, Pope, and etc. And he said that I write poetry in the language of the common man, though his poetry is not always the language of the common man, but his language is very much understandable in its sublimity. So we always have talked about Wordsworth and his egotistical sublime, as that famous uh, uh, book on Wordsworth says. So we find a lot of sublimity, a lot of transcendentalism in Wordsworth, where he talks about the deep, sad, deep music of humanity. Now, when he talks in the uh, immortality ode of the sadness of humanity, or that sad song of humanity, somewhere we can draw a parallel between Wordsworth. And so also in Keats, Keats talks about a heightened imagination because he says, whatever the imagination seizes as truth, whatever the imagination seizes as beauty is truth, whether it existed before or not. So this alignment of beauty and truth, of Satyam Shivam Sundaram, which is also perceptible very much in the uh, songs of Tagore, not just in his Gitanjali, but in many of his love and his God songs. So there I find a lot of similarity between to Wordsworth and Keats, but the radicalism which was uh, which influenced Shelley a lot, and which we find so much in his uh, Prometheus Bound and Prometheus Unbound, where you know Prometheus is stealing fire from the gods, and that he wants immortality, and this kind of rag radicalism, I really do not see. Though most Bengalis call Tagore the Bengali Shelley, I till now. Uh, would not like to specify Tagore as only the Bengali Shelley. I would like to specify him as Bengali, Wordsworth, Shelley, and Keats. Yet, there are very differences, and that would call for another lecture. Yeah, thank so, you. Thank you, ma'am. There is another related question where um, uh, Sajita KTN uh, asks us, how can you connect Tagore's thought and Emerson's concept of the Oversoul? Uh, yes, this again 
<laughs> Again, it has to be. <laughs> it has to be a short question because you yeah. see. Uh, give a uh, short answer, please, yeah, because I'm waiting. Yeah, you know, uh, though I don't compare it directly, the oversold, uh, but in some ways, even in Nietzsche, Germany, uh, if we go into the Uberman concept, you know, uh, in some ways, you know, Tagore, I think uh, he was. Why I think I know. He was a voracious reader of both Indian, ancient, Vedic, Upanishadic, as well as Western literature. Uh, so I, I cannot really segregate him from world literature because if uh, we, I mean, that would actually take a long session. So uh, that is not possible over uh, these days of pandemic. But then, you know, the the idea of Uberman, for example, Nietzsche was a philosopher, and we know that in one of his very well known songs, Tagore says, Oi Moha Manobo Ashe, Oi Manobo Ashe. Now, Maha Manav is again the concept of the Superman or the Uberman. Then in Bharat Tirtha, uh, where he says, which is very, very important, I would like to say in this same context as the Gitanjali, though Bharatita uh, doesn't come into this uh, purview, still I will say, he says, Esho he arjo, Esho onarjo, Hindu musulman, Esho Esho aj tumi ingraj, Esho Esho Krishtan, Esho Brahman, Shuchi kori mon. Dharo hat shabakar. Esho he potit. Karo aponit. Shabo apoman bhar. Mar obhisheke. Esho esho tara. Mongalo ghat haini je bhara. Shabar poroshe. Pobitro kara tirtho nire. Aji bharoter. Mohamano ber shagoro tire. Now India again is the pilgrim point of an ocean of superhumanity. So, whether it is the American transcendentalist or whether it's the philosopher Nietzsche, Tagore was a voracious reader. We can compare him with just about any literature of the world and it would not be wrong. Though the specificities are are there and that would again need another lecture thank you so much ma'am there are some questions related to uh, sufism and spiritualism maybe you could drop them up together um, kabita sahu asks you uh, what is that sole essential element of sufism which has flowered and flooded every corner of Gitanjali. And also there are other questions on Sufism, whether you could compare um, or, or do you see um, uh, Lalan Fakir on um, the influence of Lalan Fakir on Tagore's Gitanjali? We could club these two together. Uh, <clears throat> see, uh, Lalun Fakir and the Bowls of Bengal uh, would uh, re really find uh, uh, that Tagorean uh, expression in his songs more than in his uh, Gitanjali. But he was definitely Sufism also had its impact, as I said, from diverse cultures of our own Indian Kabir, our own Indian Lalun Fakir, and also. Rumi and Khalil Gibran and all that. But the basic essential, the essence of Sufism is that uh, what I said at the very beginning, the divinization of the human and the humanization of the divine. The divine lover is also in some way a human lover. And the human lover also becomes a divine lover. But Tagore's mysticism is just a 
let us say, full of Sufism. I think it it overflows beyond that because uh, Gitanjali is not just about the divine beloved and the human beloved. It goes way beyond that. But then, as I say, uh, because of this uh, translation of Kabir and uh, you know the impact of Lalon Pokir not so much on his Gitanjali as on his uh, songs, the Baul songs which impacted him. Uh, so there is a resemblance. Now the, that transcendental love, which we do not segregate in the area, in the sphere of Sufism, because as I said, in all other faiths of the world, without belittling any, if you said that God is your divine lover, or that your human lover is equivalent to God, there would be some kind of a, let us say, a kind of an impact which would not be very happy or delightful. In all other uh, faiths of the world, there is a clear dissociation between divinity and human love. Like I said, the Indian ethos where we see on our temples eroticism in sculpture, and then you enter the sanctum sanctorum, and any Western mind would say, what is this? I mean, how do you correlate this outside, the facet or the facade of the temple, with the divinity who is right inside the sanctum sanctorum? So that kind of association of idea of divinity, or divine love and human love, is not uh, so much uh, evident, not at all evident, in Western culture, but it is evident to a large extent in the Sufis of diverse cultures also. In, in Rumi, for example, in Rumi, in Khalil Gibran, we have it. We have it in Kabir also. And But in Tagore, uh, I think there is a kind of an overbrimming sense of this unity, what I call this unified sensibility. So it overflows beyond the Sufist idea of divine love and human love being two facets of the same coin. Thank you so much, ma'am. There is a very interesting question. There are some questions on spirituality. There are the students who are asking this. What, uh, Sai Spandan, Dipa, Dipankar, Chena and uh, someone else has asked this question that why is spirituality so important? Can't humans survive without it? And someone asked, Dipankar, Dipankar Jena asked, does spirituality control the creative process? Or do you think Tagore allows for other elements as operative in the creative process? That is exactly what I said. Yeah. Uh, Tagore's creative, uh, creative process is a process, is a kind of a journey of uh, a voyage uh, between, uh, as I said, the twin points of heaven and home between uh, the form, the world of forms, the world of external forms, to that formless cosmic consciousness. And it is a process, a creative process, obviously a creative process, otherwise uh, poetry would not be born out of it, nor songs would be born out of it, nor song lyrics would be born out of it. So obviously it is a creative process, but it goes through this journey. It goes through this journey and it connects and associates and assimilates and integrates these two facets. And uh, it is not just spiritualism, and it is not just humanism. It is a bridge, a kind of a bridge which Tagore creates, a kind of a very creative bridge, which Tagore uh, creates in where humanity and divinity become uh, two facets of the same coin. So definitely it's a part of his creative process. There's no doubt about it. Thank you so much, ma'am. One last question. So we won't tire you out, but this is very interesting and this is directly to you. This is by uh, uh, Kurti Fiza. She is asking you that Yates has made a statement in the introduction to Gitanjali, which is quite misogynist which is like um, degrading the ladies. You read it out in the first, uh, I mean, uh, yes. in the first section so, of your lecture. And yeah. she says, how does Tagore take it? 
that ladies are stupid they're not knowledgeable about that so no but uh, i would like to remind your student i'm sure your student has read uh during tagore's age the ones that he met while reading out i will include not just yates but also if you look at ts eliot's uh, love song of alfred prufrock uh, or wasteland you know uh, this these are mystics including yates they are mystics who were not exactly like tagore at all who were absolutely uh, i should say suspicious doubtful about the sophistication of the urbanized ladies like if you remember that famous line of ts eliot uh in the uh, what is it salon the ladies come and go talking of michael angelo now this this talking of michael angelo is what he's trying to say ts eliot in the wasteland is a kind of a superfluous a kind of an artificial kind of urbanized talk just to prove that you know michael angelo that you know art that you know literature and 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 we are talking of an age uh, around why around of the 19th 20th century the early part of it when uh, we really didn't have that kind of women empowerment or that kind of women's education though we did have these uh, you know ladies uh, totally overwrought in their uh, world of urbanized fashions and it's fashionable to talk about Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci and and T.S. Eliot and this and that so these uh, mystics because T.S. Eliot was also very much into the oriental mysticism when he was writing uh, uh, wasteland for example he he finishes it uh, with a line from the upanishads so they were very very skeptical about this newly emerging society of uh, let us say newly whether they were erudite or not i have my doubt but these newly sophisticated um what should i say urbanized ladies who would go into drawing drawing rooms and talk about art literature poetry as a kind of a fashionable talk and that is what they were skeptical about so i think when keats writes that these will will not be what he meant was small little ladies books or coffee tables you know he, his skepticism about fashionable urbanized ladies comes out and i don't i really do not in that small um, little statement any misogyny comes out but of course what comes out is the skepticism of these great british writers who were deep into the mysticism of the east so uh, their sophistication did not really pull well with these poets so that's a very small because if you read the entire introduction i do not think it is it has any fiber or any great uh, kind of penetration in it of any kind of misogynist thinking that's a small thing so uh i would really beg to differ because yes it may hurt today's ladies who are <coughs> well into uh well into women empowerment and education etc so it's a very small line in the entire introduction you may please ask your student to go through the entire introduction there's nothing like that at anywhere except the small thing and that is about his skepticism about these urbanized sophisticated ladies who were not actually at that point of time so erudite thank you so much ma'am thank you so thank much you. professor thank you shruti for having for having faith in me that i should die in the ocean and even if i'm drowned you believed that i would get out of it and i did get out of it with molly joseph telling me oh no 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 shri only you can do it of so course. i'm thankful to all of you could do justice to such a wonderful topic i couldn't think of anyone else who could do justice to tagore his philosophy the multidimensionality and with your melodious voice and 
with the tireless effort that you have given and answered each and every question of all these uh, participants. Today we have had 100 participants and from across the country. So I really thank you. And now I will request our research scholar, Deepshi Kharaudrai, to give a formal vote of thanks. Good evening, everyone, respected dignitaries and all the participants. Thank you so much for participating in our lecture series. And I don't, I'm thanking you on behalf of PG Department of English, Parampur University. Ma'am, you have made this lecture exceptionally stimulating and highly informative. We cannot thank you enough for the interesting and very informative lecture. We loved every second of it. We were virtually glued to it. I think the chat box is overflowing with applauses. They are praising so much. We, we cannot describe how much we have enjoyed your lecture and your beautiful voice that was enthralling. Our sincere gratitude to you for the sea of wisdom and knowledge that you have showered on us with your amazing lecture. You have really kept us virtually and every member of the audience hanging on to each word of yours. So, and this was, believe it or not, we are still struggling to find words to describe how fantastic your presentation was. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank all of you, uh, at least for uh, hearing me out. And uh, uh, with all your questions, I had to really delve deep into my own self. And uh, well, I managed, but about the song, uh, <laughs> well, you liked it, but uh, that is not exactly the way I sing, because I'm not a casual singer, but I'm also grateful if, if, if just if Suti had given me one little this thing, but anyway, I didn't read my English transcription, but I think people understood the song. And I'm very grateful to have sung it in Yaman Kalyan, which, which is the it right was, hour, the right, right evening was, uh, hour. <laughs> yeah, it was Professor Sharbani Banerjee who came up with the idea on the chat box. Well, yeah. I didn't have an inkling and I actually didn't dare to ask you to sing because, you know, I didn't want to transgress my limitations. And now I would just, um, I have another little request that is I would ask my two other colleagues uh, just to say one, one word of thank you to you, um, Dr. T. Shwaral and Mr. Anil Kumar Piria. They would also like to say thank you to you. And also, uh, sorry, I forgot, Professor Balabhadra Tripathi would also like to say a formal thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you, Professor Banerjee, for a nice talk, as I told earlier. It was really engrossing. Every and, one of uh, us uh, took interest in the talk. Gitanjali uh, is there in our syllabus, and students love to read the text. And uh, your talk today became more informative and helpful uh, for understanding the text better. So thank you so much for your nice talk. Thank you. Dr. Anil, yeah, Anil is there. Good evening, madam. Thank you very much, madam, for a wonderful speech. I really enjoyed and I learned uh, many things. See, uh, I was when I was when you were delivering the speech, I was trying to find out my connection, miss, my spiritual connection. Yes, I am the nature worship. I'm a nature worship. But no, I believe in the nature worship. Uh, I belong to uh, uh, four tribes. You have been the Quran University. You are the, the vice, vice chancellor there. Uh, or my wife also is working there. So anyhow, I invited my wife, but uh, because of this, she was not there. She was not. But anyhow, I wanted to ask you what was the connection between philosophy and the Tagore philosophy. But anyhow, when you said, I already got the answer. But anyhow, ma'am, I enjoyed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Dr. T. Rao, are you there? Uh, all right, ma'am. Thank you for 
you know, you haven't even had a drop of water uh, since you began your talk. And it's no, been I, long I did have hours. a sip when you asked me to sing. I sipped you know? just one <laughs> sip of water. <laughs> and and it's, it's like historical because uh, I have never, as I said, for any recording, for any program, ever talked so much in full throated ease. And then this full throated ease becomes a crack throated ease. But doesn't matter. Thank you so, so much. Thank you very much for uh, for hearing me. And and um, uh, uh, goodbye. Thank you and goodbye, madam. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you for keeping our request. Thank you. As she left.